If you have osteoporosis and you're concerned about fracturing a hip, a thigh, or a compression fracture in your back, or even your wrist, you've come to the right place, because that's exactly what we're going to talk about in this video, the symptoms of osteoporosis. In this video, we're going to cover, first of all, what it is. At what point do you have a low enough bone density to be called osteoporotic? We'll also discuss the symptoms, causes of osteoporosis, and we'll do a little bit of myth busting about some of the sacred cows of osteoporosis. Like why you don't need calcium, why you don't need weight bearing exercise, and why vitamin D is overrated for osteoporosis, and what really matters. Before we get, get into it, who am I? My name is Igor, I'm the author of the book, uh, which is an Amazon bestseller, Osteoporosis Reversal Secrets, and my team and I, we specialize in helping people with osteoporosis increase their bone density and reduce their fractures. So let's start with talking about what is osteoporosis. Here's the way I explain it in my public speaking engagements. Imagine a healthy bone is like an arrow chocolate bar. An osteoporotic bone is like Swiss cheese, lots of air, very little bone. And medically speaking, what's a score that tells uh, a practitioner, a, a doctor, and so on, that a person has osteoporosis? Well, they use something called T-scores. A T-score of minus 2.5 is indicative of osteoporosis, and a T-score of minus 1 is indicative of something called osteopenia, which is a step before osteoporosis. You could have different T-scores in different parts of the body. The hip versus the pelvis versus the lower back versus the wrist. Um, so you may have osteoporosis in some areas but not in others, or you could have osteoporosis in different areas and varying levels of osteoporosis. We should also distinguish between primary osteoporosis and secondary osteoporosis. Primary osteoporosis, the primary cause is aging. There is no other medical condition that gives a person osteoporosis. Secondary osteoporosis is, as the name implies, secondary to some other condition going on in the body. Things like Cushing's disease, uh, Crohn's, colitis, or anything else that prevents the absorption of minerals and nutrients responsible for the bone density. It could also be secondary to taking certain medications. For example, one medication that if the, if the doctor gets the dose wrong could potentiate osteoporosis is hyperthyroidism. Um, or sorry, the medication is Synthroid. Um, another one is prednisone, which is used as an anti-inflammatory, so that's the upside, but the downside is it, is it could wear away bone density. And there are others. So that's primary versus secondary osteoporosis. Uh, as for symptoms of osteoporosis, here's the, the interesting thing. There are none. And that's what makes it called a silent disease or a silent killer, because it doesn't hurt. Weak bones don't hurt. Fractured bones, broken bones, those hurt. But you don't just don't know you have it. Uh, so, and that's a real problem because you can find out you have osteoporosis one of two ways. Either one, you can get tested for it, and if you're a woman after the age of 50, you often do get tested for it, and you find out you have it. Or two, there's a rude awakening. You bump into something without a lot of force, and you fracture something. Uh, those could both be signs of osteoporosis of a, or, or a fracture. Um, now, once you've heard something, there's a lot of symptoms, of course. Uh, there are broken bones, uh, there's less mobility, there's lower quality of life, potentially having to end up in a, in a home and be careful for carriers and so on. Um, and so what are some of the causes of osteoporosis? There are multiple causes. One is low estrogen levels. This is particularly common in postmenopausal women once the ovaries no longer make as much estrogen as they used to. Another one is low testosterone levels. This is more for men. Although with men, osteoporosis comes about 15 to 20 years after women. The prevalence is much lower because by that point, they're often just dead. Um, and another one is malabsorption. If there are gastrointestinal conditions preventing you from absorbing nutrients, again, like Crohn's, colitis, and others, um, that could prevent you from, that, that could prevent you from building the bone density that you need to have strong enough bones to prevent osteoporosis. So you know the symptoms, you know the causes, you know what it is, you know primary versus secondary. Let's talk about treatments and myth busting. A lot of things that are said to improve bone density and osteoporosis are just not correct. To bar with you, the biggest sacred calcium of them all, calcium. Calcium does not improve fracture risk. Here's what it does do. Calcium increases bone density. But we have to ask ourselves a deeper question. What's the purpose of greater bone density? We want greater bone density for a lower risk of fractures. But what if it increases your, it increases your bone density without decreasing the fracture risk? Well, then you just cheated the test because you just look good on the test, but you don't actually, that doesn't translate to real world risk reduction. And that's what calcium does. It cheats the test. It increases your bone density without reducing the fracture risk. Now, there are also harms to it. So it's not just cheats the test, but, other, uh, uh, but it's otherwise inert. There are real risks to taking calcium. Excessive calcium could cause kidney stones, it could cause soft tissue calcification, and so on. Another sacred cow is the myth of vitamin D. This is really only a half myth. 
because low vitamin D levels absolutely will result in osteoporosis. So a lot of people are going towards the trend of, um, of megadosing vitamin D. They take crazy doses, 5,000, 10,000 AUs per day or more in hopes of greater bone density. And here's what happens. Most nutrients, if you have, if you to go from deficient to sufficient, uh, gives you great health benefits. Sufficient to excessive is detrimental as well. So blood levels of vitamin D are perfect when they're in the middle. If you go too high, that can actually cause low bone density as well, which is interesting that both low vitamin D and high vitamin D cause low bone density and osteoporosis. The body's kind of like Goldilocks. It doesn't like too little of anything or too much of anything. It likes a just right amount. Same thing with vitamin D. You want to be in the middle of the reference range, which is a great case for testing your vitamin D levels before you start supplementing with vitamin D. So we've barbecued the sacred cow of calcium, vitamin D. Let's also barbecue the sacred cow of weight-bearing exercise. What is usually meant when, uh, when weight-bearing exercise is recommended just walking. And walking is weight-bearing exercise, but that doesn't mean that it's effective for uh, increasing bone density. In fact, in a number of studies from my book, I referenced walking and how people who walk still lose bone density just as fast as people who don't walk. Uh, so walking doesn't really do a, hell, uh, a heck of a lot. And so if calcium doesn't really work, if vitamin D doesn't really work that well, and weight-bearing exercise like walking doesn't really work, what really works? Well, let's break it down into exercise, nutrition, and supplements. From an excess perspective, we have to address the, the prevention side of things first. So don't fall to begin with. And how do you do that? With balance training. And I go into various different balance exercises in my book, but you really have to train your balance to prevent falling. Step two is if you fall, you have to prevent the, 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 the chance of breaking a bone or fracturing a bone. To do that, you need a combination of strength training and jump training. Now, contrary to popular belief, what strengthens muscles doesn't necessarily strengthen bones. There's a lot of ways to strengthen your muscles and make them bigger without having an impact on your bones. You really want to go after the bones. And so the key to making strength training work for bones is using A, a heavy enough weight that you can do between five and eight repetitions. If you can do a 10th or 11th repetition, the weight is too light. If you can't do five, it's too heavy. That's key number one. Key number two is to use exercises for these specific areas where you want to improve bone density. In other words, you could do push-ups and that will improve bone density in the shoulders, but really bone density um, is tested at the wrist, the hip, the pelvis overall, and the lower back. So you really want to do some exercises for those. So things like squats, deadlifts, one-legged deadlifts, things like that are very, very effective for building bone density in those areas. The other element of strength training that's very important is the tempo. When you're lifting a weight, you want to lift it as hard as you can. So for example, if you're doing curls, you don't just lift it in the control way, you want to lift it up as quickly as possible. Uh, that's part of the key. And you want to do strength training between two to three times per week. So there are your parameters for exercise prescription for osteoporosis. That's exercise. Now what about nutrition? Again, contrary to popular belief, calcium and vitamin D don't do a heck of a lot. The single most important nutrient for osteoporosis is actually protein. Very often, people who have osteoporosis don't get adequate protein. In one study in my book, there was a, uh, in, in the, the participants were divided into, into four groups. One group was people who got less than 16% of their daily calories as protein. Uh, group two, 16 to 18% of their daily calories as protein. Group three, 18 to 20. Group four, 20, 20 or more. And what they found is that in the group that got the least protein, there were 16 fractures in the duration of the, of the study. In the group that got the highest protein, 20% of them or more of their daily calories, only five, only five fractures happened in the duration of the study. Based on parameters for the same age, menopausal status, etc., everything else was the same. What does that tell us? Protein is the single most important nutrient for bone strength and fractures, which is really what matters. Not just bone density, but fractures. And that's the nutrition side of it. As for supplementation, the single most important supplement for osteoporosis is type 1 collagen. A lot of women take collagen for the purpose of hair, skin, and nails. That's a different type of collagen. That's usually type 3 collagen. Type 3 collagen will give you nice hair, skin, and nails, but won't do anything for your bones. So type 1 collagen is exactly the type you want to use at a dose of about 5 grams per day. Uh, that's the most, uh, most important supplement, but, but another powerful supplement, but less uh, less impactful is for especially postmenopausal women is something called soy isoflavones. And soy isoflavones 
are natural compounds found in soy and soy protein. And what they do is they stimulate estrogen receptors because as estrogen drops, so does bone density. They increase estrogen to some extent. So now we've covered the exercise, nutrition, supplementation recommendations if you want to control and possibly reverse osteoporosis. If you like this video, subscribe, click like, and I hope you benefit from it.